Um, I began my career at Sing Sing. Uh, I became a New York State parole officer in 1969. And um, as part of my uh, training, my first assignment was to work in the parole office at Sing Sing. And as, as men would, would come into the prison, we would uh, uh, write up, we would interview them and, and, and write up a case history for the use of the parole board later on when they became eligible. And uh, I was literally, uh, when I started there, not yet past, uh, uh, six months past my 21st birthday. I, I, was, I was a kid. Uh, I don't think I was shaving. And I had grown up in, uh, in the city in a you know, middle class household. I had gone to college. I hadn't grown up saying I want to be a parole officer, certainly didn't grow up saying I want to work in prisons. I actually uh, sort of uh, took a civil service job and, gee, this sounds interesting. And, and there I was. And um, on my first day there, uh, a fellow whose name stays with me to this day, his name was Tony Contrero, who at the time was a senior counselor at Sing Sing, was assigned to show me around the prison. So here I was, this fresh-faced kid and wide-eyed. I had never been, I had never been familiar with crime. I had never been to a jail, let alone a prison. And here I was at Sing Sing, and he was walking me around, and the buildings were enormous and imposing, and you know the gates are slamming behind you. And we, I, I vividly remember walking pet, you know, down the, the length of, of the old cell block and talking. But what I remember most is that Tony Contrero said to me then, kid, he said, there's nothing new under the sun in corrections. This was 1969. Um, and so here I am today, uh, 48 years later, nearly 50 years later, uh, often speaking to young people uh, coming to work in, in, in prisons and in criminal justice. And I say to them, kid, there's nothing new under the sun in corrections. Uh, what we do uh, in this country to respond to crime is what we've been doing since uh, federal, Federalist times, since just after the Revolutionary War. Uh, we've, we've been doing it the same way for more than 200 years. Uh, and, and pretty much getting the same results. Uh, and as, as they say, the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing and expect to get a different result. Well, it's been more than 200 years. Uh, it's time for us to recognize that we're not going to get a different result. And we put, a, we put different patinas on it. We attach different names. Uh, we call them penitentiaries. We call them reformatories. We call them prisons. We call them correctional facilities. Uh, but the, at, the end of, and at the end of the day, what we manufacture in prisons, uh, and, I, and I speak about prisons as opposed to jails because people spend a lot of time in prisons, is we manufacture anger and despair. Um, the, the, I've come to the conclusion that the uh, concept of imprisonment by its very nature runs so counter to uh, human nature. The notion of taking men, it's all men, uh, and, and separating them from the wider society in this very artificial environment where we create scarcity. We create scarcity. You can't uh, just walk over to a vending machine and, uh, and get a, a Hershey's bar. You can't uh, get a can of soda when you want a can of soda or a bag of potato chips. Uh, you can't talk to your mother or your grandmother or your wife or your sister whenever you want. You can't have cigarettes. You can't have alcohol. You can't have drugs. You have no contact with the opposite sex. And when we create a world like that, no matter whether we have college programs, no matter whether we have vocational training, no matter whether the cells are 80 square feet or 21 square feet in size, uh, the fact is that we have 
created a world in which uh, the very behaviors that we want to extinguish arise. Right? People have to find all sorts of coping mechanisms to deal with their deprivations. And I despair, personally, uh, as to what the solution will be. I recognize I'm certainly not a prison abolitionist. Uh, I recognize that uh, we will always have prisons. We need prisons for several reasons. There are clearly some people who uh, are scary. You know, the one that oh, I always use is John Muhammad. You remember the, you're, I can tell this audience is old enough to remember the Washington Sniper, right? You know, you can't have a society where people who's just sort of taking pot shots wherever they, you know, taking shots with guns wherever they want. Uh, you, you have to take that person off the street, David Berkowitz. We, we, we can think of people who clearly, we agree, can't be out among us. And uh, there is a role for punishment in our society. Prisons and imprisonment do fulfill uh, an important symbolic function. Uh, if, if there is no hard price to be paid for serious misbehaviors, then uh, it, it's fair to assume that, that, that they will increase rather than, than decrease. And, and we don't want individuals taking the law into their own hands. So prisons, there has to be some harshness. But we overuse them. We lack, create, I've come to the conclusion that we lack creativity in our response to crime. Uh, the, the, um, I often give uh, the Martha Stewart example. What purpose was served by sending Martha Stewart to prison? Uh, could we not have achieved, uh, I, I hope nobody here is a friend and neighbor, I guess she lives in the neighborhood, but um, could we have a, a, achieved the same social purpose of deterring her from doing it again, deterring others from doing it again, uh, 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 hurting her enough to satisfy the vengeance need of whoever was hurt by it, if perhaps we had put her on a pedestal or a platform uh, in Times Square uh, and said she had to come there every day for three months or six months with a sign that said, I am a liar, uh, and, uh, and then had to do a year's worth of community service. And I think of, uh, of Anthony Weiner, right, who just went to prison for 21 months, awful, reprehensible, but what if we had put him on public display with a sign that said, I am a pervert, right? And then forced him to do community service. Could we not achieve our social goals without this reliance on imprisonment? In the United States, we spend $80 billion a year on prisons. Prisons, because of their very nature, grow corruption. The people in them are mentally ill. The fact that in 2000 and 17, as Brent said, 24% of the prisoners are mentally ill. In, in county jails, it's, it approaches 40%. What does that say about our society? So, time to wrap up, I suppose. I think the importance of having something like a Sing Sing Museum is critically important because we put people in prison in our name. We the people put people in prison. And too often, the public wants to walk away from that responsibility. And as long as they do, we will continue to get the results we have obtained. And unless and until people become more aware, become more connected, and take greater ownership of what imprisoning fellow human beings means, uh, we will not see change. Thank you. So there's a lot, lot uh, to think about and talk about. Justin, we're looking forward to your comments. There yes. certainly is, and that's a, a tough act to follow, two tough acts to follow, both from Dana and Martin, so I appreciate uh, your time here today. Um, similar to how the commissioner started his career as, as a parole officer and ended up in, in a prison on his first day, um, I kind of took a, a strange route in, in finding myself in this industry, and I will call it an industry, um, because it is, a, it is a huge part of American society that people don't realize it exists, um, both local jails and, and state penitentiaries. 
I grew up in Westchester. I'm a product of the Westchester public school system. I've lived here all my life. Uh, I went to Colgate University as a history major. Um, so the fact that I'm now a deputy commissioner at the county jail certainly was not something that I, I saw myself on a path to um, back when I was in upstate New York in the early 90s. I went to law school at Pace uh, and I found myself in the county attorney's office working on things like car accidents and lawsuits and federal civil rights violations and things like that. And I, I quickly became involved in working with the Department of Correction um, right there in Valhalla, New York. You've probably passed it on the brain when you go by right next to the Westchester Medical Center. Uh, we're the second largest department in the county um, after social services. Uh, we have approximately 900 staff members and approximately 1,000 inmates. Uh, it's a massive facility. And we like to say we're a good neighbor if you don't even know that we're there. Uh, you pass by us on the sprain. We're open 24-7, 365. It's an enormously expensive uh, place to run. It's over $130 million a year. Virtually all tax levy, meaning that you as Westchester residents pay the salaries, the services, uh, and the various things that go on there. Um, just to clarify for people, just to give you a very brief 101, uh, the difference between jails and prisons, which a lot of people always kind of generally have an idea of what a jail is as compared to a prison, but prisons are, are essentially where you go after you've been sentenced. Jails are where you are uh, when you're either sentenced to local time or awaiting trial. Um, so most of our population is a very fluid one. What we're dealing with at the county jail are people who are coming in right off the streets in active distress. Uh, we process approximately 7,000 admissions per year. Uh, at any given time, we have, like I said, right now approximately uh, 1,000 people in custody. Since I've been there for eight years, uh, I've, we've seen our prison population reduce, which is a great thing. Uh, when I came in 2009, we were up in the 1600s. We've actually dipped down into the mid-900s. I don't take any credit for that, but I do um, point to our community partners and to the courts and to other county departments like probation, parole. Um, there has been a lot of attention paid uh, to prison reform in Westchester particularly. Um, I'd like to be out of business, frankly. I'd like to go work for parks or, or teach, history. Go, teach history or sell wind chimes on the beach or do something other than running a jail. Um, there is a, certainly a place for it, as there is certainly a place for a state prison. Um, but the footprint of, of incarceration in America is a, is a large one. We incarcerate more of our population than any other Western uh, civilization. I believe it's at a rate of approximately 7% of our population is under some form of, of custodial supervision, whether that's parole, probation, or actually in custody. Um, so when you're dealing with a local jail like we do, as I said, it's a population is a very fluid one. Um, in prisons, in state prisons, those people are there because they've already been to local, local jail. Uh, they've been sentenced, and they're now serving a sentence. We have people who are coming in in active states of distress, um, having just committed or alleged to have committed a crime from all corners of the county and charged with everything from shoplifting at the Galleria to forcible rape, first degree murder, things like that. Um, and each one of those inmates is different and you need to treat them like human beings uh, with unique needs and unique uh, backgrounds, um, unique threats and you know, certainly unique concerns. It, it is an enormous upheaval. Um, as the commissioner said, removing somebody from society. Uh, in state prison, like you said about um, you know, not even being able to buy a Hershey bar, in local jail, the, the similar situation is you've just been removed from your family. Um, you've been removed from your home. Who's gonna pay your rent? Who's going to worry about your lights being turned off? You may have a, a dog sitting in an apartment somewhere. I mean, you really are removed from your community. Um, and there's a lot of things that go along with that. Act, you know, your, your children, and we have minors in custody, some of whom are just pulled out of the school system halfway through the day. How do we, and, you know, how do we make sure that their educational needs are met? Um, given the fact that we're such a fluid population, we see an enormous amount of people coming into custody with co-occurring substance abuse issues, particularly the opiates right now, um, mental health, is one of our largest obstacles and concerns in county jails. 
Um, I would say approximately, I believe at, at our last check, roughly 60% of our population has some sort of a mental health diagnosis. Um, and those are the people that we really focus on. I think the commissioner would agree with me that a lot of this population, particularly in state prison, kind of knows how to run themselves. They know how to jail, as we say, as a verb in the industry. Um, people in local jails, really, a lot of them, it's their first time there, or they're there because of quality of life crimes. Um, the trespasses, the criminal possession of a controlled substance, things like that. What's always interesting to me is when people ask me questions about it, like how do you make sure that the you keep the ax murderers away from the pickpockets? Um, what's interesting is your, your underlying charges, the reason why you came into jail does not necessarily reflect your institutional behavior. Very, a lot of times the person who's there on very serious charges may be a model inmate while they're in the county jail, and that person who's there on very minor local charges may be the person that uh, causes you the most um, concern with threats to self-harm, threats to your staff, um, the people that you have, have to have a very active hand with. Out of our thousand or so inmates, you know, there's five or six at any given time that are we, we have to devote the most care to, the most concern to, as to their in-custody behavior. Um, they can actually tie up an entire shift with the amount of times going back and forth to the emergency room um, and to court and, and advocacy. Um, I consider myself a reformer. We've made enormous strides in Westchester to try and change the model. We consider ourselves, um, you never want to be the best jail. <laughs> but then there's, is there such a thing as the best jail in New York? We would like to be that best jail and, and be a place that others can look to. Um, We've been awarded the uh, National Mental Health Program of the Year by the National uh, NCCHA, the National Commission on Correctional Health Care, as a result of our mental health uh, initiatives, particularly with regard to reentry, with having men return to, because keep in mind a lot of local inmates are returning directly to these streets in Yonkers and directly to those communities in Katona. People in jail tend to discharge the community rather than to go upstate. Um, so we take, we place an, an enormous amount of focus on our mentally ill population, our minors. Uh, obviously, Rage the Age is a big change for us now. We will be losing the 16 and 17 year olds over the next two years, but minors in custody, mentally ill people in custody, uh, seniors in custody with the graying of the population. There's also been a graying of the prison and jail population. Uh, we have people anywhere from 16 years of age to 86 years of age. Um, we have people who are very medically ill. In addition to, med to mentally ill, we've seen a, a, a rise in people coming into custody that are medically ill. Um, and each one of those cases is different. We may have to manage somebody who's actively undergoing oncology, uh, oncology treatment. At any given time, we have three or four uh, female inmates who may never have seen, maybe 38 weeks pregnant, who have never been to an obstetrician and have to, you know, they're potentially going into labor within hours of coming in. Uh, we have people in power wheelchairs. We have people with hardware in their bodies. We have people with, you know, gunshot wounds. So it, it, every day is different. Like you said before, there's nothing new to this, but at this, to the same, same extent, every day is different. Every inmate is different. You know, every, every staff member is different. A big piece of this is staff. We have over 800 staff members. Uh, we want them to all go home safe. And we recognize this is not like being a cop. You are guaranteed to have a tough day when you work in a jail. You're guaranteed to go in there and work with between 40 and 60 grown men who all have the attention span and the self-control of a second grader. Uh, people that are saying, why did he get a shower? I want my shower. Why does he get a magazine? I don't get my magazine. This is a tough, tough industry for people to work in. You see a lot of burnout with these staff members, with people who have high rates of domestic abuse, substance abuse, um, co-occurring medical and mental health conditions. So you, part of being a good administrator of a jail is you have to really make sure that you're doing the right thing for your staff. Um, so it is a fascinating industry. It's one that a lot of people don't know a lot about. I certainly did not see myself working in this or know much about it even during the six years I was in the county attorney's office. So it, it is something that we all need to be aware of is going on in our backyard because these people are returning to our backyards and our front yards. So. I'm certainly uh, thankful to be here and be part of it.
but thank you. Well, I want to open it up for, for questions. I have a number of questions myself, but I will uh, defer to some of the people in the audience who I know have been listening carefully. And uh, we have two real experts here from the state level, actually national level, and, and uh, from the county. So my question is, Mr. Prime, mm -hmm. you said that your office has the largest budget in Westchester County, followed by social services. I'm wondering where education is there to prevent those young men and women from ending up in a place where they're not ever going to get an education. Thank you. Um, I said that we have the second largest, after the Department of Social Services, we have the second largest position count uh, in the county. But regardless, we do have a, a large budget, well in excess of $100 million. Um, what's amazing in this is roughly 80% of that budget goes towards staff salaries to pay for the approximate 900 staff members that we have at any given time. That being said, we do have a partnership with uh, Southern Westchester BOCES. Uh, we do provide teachers on site, we have a principal, uh, we have a school, and so we do have adult learning programs that approximately anywhere between 200 and 250 of our uh, inmate population, our adult population, uh, do participate in that, and that's, that's uh, voluntary. Every inmate under 18 is required to participate in school, and to the best extent that we can, we try and bridge um, with their outside, with, with their school district that they come out of, these minors, um, on the outside. So we're trying to keep them in line with the same curriculum that they were following while they were outside in the world. Um, so we do have task available, which is the new version of GED. Um, and so people do, are, are part of the community. Um, one of the key distinctions, again, between state prison and local jails is the average length of stay. Uh, you can do these dynamic programs in state prisons, things like getting college degrees and masters because you're there for, unfortunately, a longer period of time. Our average length of stay is anywhere between 45 and 60 days, uh, keeping in mind that a lot of people out of those 7,000 admissions a year that we have, uh, you can have people there for two or three hours. You can have people there for two or three months. Uh, our sentence prisoners can be um, incarcerated at the county jail for up to two uh, consecutive one-year sentences. But really, the, the fact that our population is so fluid and they discharge in and out so quickly, um, hinders most local jails from the ability to do any of these programs like uh, you know, college courses, it's something we've explored with the community college. Um, it is available, but like I said, people are there from a matter of hours to you know, up to a year. So that, that, that is the reason behind it. Well, it's absolutely the right question. Um, and you know, in, in New York and throughout the nation, really, uh, until the mid-90s, um, certainly in New York, there was a very robust higher education program. So as Justin said, under New York law, uh, any individual up to the age of 18 who has not graduated from high school is required to attend high school and the jail is required to provide high school education or its equivalent and that's so they use BOCES. Uh, individuals with learning disabilities, I think, are eligible to receive education up to 23, I think. Um, and but then they get to prison. And so in, up until the 90s, in New York, there was a very robust college program. Colleges all over the state, Cornell, Bard, uh, uh, Mercy, Mercy yeah. well, colleges all over the, the state were coming into uh, the prisons and offering college programs. Uh, and the uh, student tuition was being paid for by Pell Grants. In the mid-90s, uh, when uh, uh, Newt Gingrich uh, ran the Congress and they had the contract on America. Um, one of the things that they did was they basically uh, did away with, they, they basically said that prison inmates were no longer eligible for Pell Grants, so there was no way to pay for that education. Uh, that changed in, in recent years, and you may recall several years ago that Governor Andrew Cuomo tried to bring back higher education programs in the prisons and took a lot of heat for it and ultimately had to back off. 
And ultimately in New York, they were able to uh, rebuild the college uh, education program throughout the state with uh, money from the New York County District Attorney's Office. Uh, Cyrus Vance has been getting a bad rap this week. Um, but the fact is that money that they get in fines and penalties from big banks that violate state banking laws, millions of dollars has gone into underwriting college education, including, including Hudson Link. And I think it's worth noting that of all the prisons in the state, Sing Sing has throughout been a beacon. Uh, Sing Sing has been very fortunate in recent years to have very uh, forward-looking wardens, superintendents. Brian Fisher, who's a dear friend who spoke in this series the other night, uh, was a champion of higher education and kept it going with private money, even in its darkest days. But today, because of the resurgence in state funding uh, and, and the uh, new eligibility for Pell Grants, uh, there are robust college programs. And that's all good. The, the idea that we would ha when I was a young parole officer, after I left Sing Sing, I went to work on, and a parole officer works with men and women after they come out of prison, helping them to readjust, helping them with their reentry. And I did that for many years. And I, I vividly remember a fellow who came back to New York City after having served a prison term at Auburn Prison. And when he came to me, he was 34 years old. Uh, he had gone to prison when he was 17 for a murder charge. He was in a youth gang and had shot a member of a rival gang. And he came out after 17 years, and after 17 years in the custody of the people of New York State, he hadn't finished high school. Shame on us. That still happens. The idea that anyone who stay, uh, look, if they stay in prison six months, a year, 18 months, okay, but the idea that somebody stays in prison for upwards of two years, an adult, and, and in this day and age where you can't work if you can't read and write, right, doesn't leave prison with a minimum of a high school education and perhaps more. I don't believe, I, I don't believe a whole lot in rehabilitation. Uh, we can talk more about that. But uh, I do believe that you can teach a person to read and write. We're much better at that than we are at Freudian analysis, right, or psychological mumbo jumbo. I can't fix, I, I tell my students, only the shadow knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men. I don't know what evil lurks in the hearts of men and I never will, but I know if they can read or write and we ought to focus on reading and writing. Just briefly following up on that too, Commissioner. I'm always surprised at the amount of pushback that you get from the community on any kind of program that you extend to the incarcerated population. If you look in the comments on the bottom of any um, article on News 12 or, or Lohut or the Journal News or, or New York Times, it's, it's uniformly uh, hateful. hateful. It's that, you know, we're still talking about, we're, we're pushing back against this Auburn-style thinking. Uh, people should be in there at the loom, um, you know, working or, or making license plates or something like that. You know, we do a lot, but again, so much of, of the, um, of our budget is, goes to staff salaries that there is not a lot of interest out there in the public, in the public for things like drug treatment programs and higher learning and things like that. So it is uniformly out in the community something that people do not, <laughs> do not support great numbers. And that's, a, that's, a, that's that plays a lot into why people come back to the streets not equipped for survival. And that's why conversations like this are so important. Yes. You, um, you mentioned today the importance of having a responsible public. And to have a responsible public, you need an educated public. And these issues are very, very complex. Is there anything happening where we could learn? I mean, I, I want to understand criminal justice 101 and understand the different sort of octopus arms that go out to each one of these things so that we can advocate individually as citizens, the ones that, we, that resonate powerfully for us so that we can vote appropriately 
uh, knowingly and be responsible to make the changes that would be productive? Um, so I, I don't know specifically uh, about Westchester County, although I'm, I'm sure there, there are organizations, uh, but there are ways to get involved. And you're absolutely right, there is not enough of it, right? Uh, and certainly uh, the popular media does not cover the issue of incarceration in a responsible fashion, right? Uh, as I, I always used to say to my wife, nobody writes a story that says nothing happened at Sing Sing today. <laughs> I, uh, I used to tell my staff, yeah, you know, everybody watched uh, uh, Orange is the New Black and uh, uh, the Oz or Law and Order, right? Every time, you know, Lenny Briscoe wanted to get somebody to confess, he said, if you don't confess, we're going to send you to Sing Sing and they're going to put you in a cell with Bubba and you know what's going to happen. It didn't matter if you were a white guy, Bubba was a big black guy. If you were a black guy, Bubba was a big white guy with, you know, <laughs> Confederate flag uh, tattoos. Didn't matter. But it's, it's all about fear. Um, so so it, it is hard to get information. And, and because prisons and jails are kept far away, I mean, the whole debate in New York City about Rikers Island, right? We, we put the jails in New York City on an island in the middle of the East River that nobody even knows where it is. Prisons should be, as it is in Westchester, part of the community. It is. It, I like to say prisons are as much of, uh, part of the infrastructure of a community as firehouses and libraries prisons and jails. It's, it's just part of life. And the closer they are, the more people would see them and understand them, have the ability to go in and volunteer. But let me just say, in New York, there is an organization, and it, it's more relative to or relevant to prisons than jails. There is a wonderful organization called the Correctional Association of New York. Uh, one of its earliest founders, actually, was Thomas Maud Osborne. The Correctional Association of New York was formed in 1846. And it has a charter from the New York State Legislature that gives it the authority to enter any state prison in the state. And its job back then was to provide citizen oversight of the state's prisons. And the state now has a formal body established under the state constitution that does that, but the Correctional Association of New York exists to this day. It's a private voluntary organization. But here's my point. They, they do lots of things. They do research, they do public policy. If you go to their website, you can get their newsletter, and they provide lots of information about what's going on in the state prisons. But most importantly, they have what they call a visiting committee. And this, this goes back to their 1846 charter. And they have groups of citizens. Anybody can join, and they train you. And periodically, they will take a group of people from this visiting committee to visit, and they visit every prison in New York State every year and write a report about it. And those reports are available to the public. And if somebody wants to get involved, that's, that's the best way to learn what's going on inside the state's prisons. Just, just briefly, um, as a member of the public with regard to jails and prisons, I think the deck is, the deck is stacked against you um, with regard to freedom of information laws because there's broad preclusions on safety and security and things like that. So me personally, and, and, and I try and strike a right balance, I'm, I'm the public information officer for the jail and I recognize that there is, the jails are a matter of public interest, but we always try and balance the security side of that. I mean, we're a policy driven organization. We have over 200 policies at the jail, everything from handicap parking to inmates facing the death penalty. So I wrestle with this a lot. Um, one of the other uh, organizations that I, I work with a lot uh, is the New York Civil Liberties Union. Uh, they have a very active interest in conditions of confinement in New York. Uh, they submit FOIL requests for data and they publish that on their websites. Uh, and there are a lot of opportunities to volunteer um, in state prisons and in local jails. <coughs> we have over 400, I think, volunteer clergy members from all walks of life, um, imams, rabbis, pastors. Um, we work a lot with uh, faith-based organizations, but also with general community organizations like uh, Family Services of New York, the Emerge program. We just did a great uh, um, gardening program with our female inmates, and also we've been doing it for many years with our male inmates with food bank. Uh, last year we donated over 10,000 meals grown at the jail for people. So there are ways to get involved. 
Um, as the commissioner said, don't believe what you see on Oz uh, or Law and Order. These things don't take an hour to play themselves out in their criminal prosecutions. Um, that's what always got me as a lawyer, is watching, I wish my cases moved that fast. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, literature out there. Um, Netflix has some great documentaries. I believe one's called The 13th, which is about how people in, in incarcerated are in a unique niche where they are kind of subject to situations similar to uh, what the forefathers did, you know, want, did not want with slavery. Um, there's some other ones out there, things like uh, Prisoners of Katrina. Uh, well, there's also the documentary that's simply called Rikers that was produced right. by Bill Moyers. Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, the most recent one about Khalid Browder um, and the Rikers story. So that there are there is information out there. It's just you, you have to affirmatively seek it out. I have, um, is there a, uh, another question? I have one. Oh, go ahead. I'll get the last question. Hi, I had a quick question. I was just wondering if any of you uh, know what the current trend is in the for-profit prison system, whether it's plateauing or it's still expanding. Uh, in the waning days of the Obama administration, uh, I was getting a flurry of, of calls from uh, investors, private equity firms, hedge funds, asking uh, whether they should sell their, their investment, get rid of their investments in private prisons because uh, the uh, uh, Department of Justice uh, at the federal level decided that they were going to get out of the business of using private prisons. Uh, their fortunes have turned around considerably. Uh, the private prison industry is booming. I don't think it's, we're in any danger of it taking over. Um, in, and, and I think uh, we have to separate what the companies that are in the business of private incarceration, and mostly we're talking about a company called GEO, another company CCA. called Core Civic, which used to be Corrections Corporation of America, and a somewhat smaller company called MTC Management and Training Corporation. But those are the three predominant players in the private incarceration market. Uh, but I would divide their work into segments. So there's a growing segment and a growing uh, business for them in immigration detention. That has, so to speak, saved their cookies from going down the tubes. And that all gets caught up in the whole immigration debate. Uh, but that's, that's really, right now, their major guaranteed revenue stream. Then they do a piece of business with the federal government, where they house prisoners for the federal government. And then they do a piece of business with state and local government, where they house prisoners for states and municipalities uh, in a variety of different ways. In turn, so keeping, let's put aside the immigration population, but just among prisoners convicted of or accused of crime, right, the business that Justin and I are in, they've, they only account for about 8% of all the prisoners in custody nationally. And they're, uh, they're, they, they grew for a while, but they've plateaued. So, and in fact, had the federal government pulled the rug out, they would have gone down, but then the immigration thing came along, and, and so overall their, their, their business has improved. Um, you, you, can, you can spend a whole evening just talking about the pros and cons of, of private prisons. Uh, obviously, the, 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 the uh, primary concern is the notion of people making a profit on human misery and on the confinement of others. Um, but keep in mind that there are lots of other ways that, as, as Justin referred to it as an industry, that people make money on the industry. Everybody from the local green grocer here in Westchester County who provides fruits and vegetables to the 1,700 men at Sing Sing, uh, to medical providers, right? Phone companies. Uh, there are lots of ways that people make money on imprisonment, private prisons being one of them. Uh, and I think. The, the quality of, of work that private prisons do, it, 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 in, in what I've observed, is, look, private prisons are private companies. They're going to do what they're going to do to maximize profits. But they're under contract to a government entity. 
And if that government entity writes a contract that is so poorly written, that doesn't have performance standards, and they don't hold that private provider to account. If they write a contract that says, we're going to give you 2,000 inmates, and we're going to pay you $100 a day, and the, and the government, the state, or the municipality doesn't say, and you must have so many officers, and your officers must be trained for six months, and every inmate shall get so many um, uh, hours of education every day, and there shall be a nurse on duty 24 hours a day. Shame on government if government doesn't enforce that. And I think a lot of the bad things we read about private prisons are really the result of government saying, here, take our money, take these people off our hands, and don't bother us. And, 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 that, and that gets the whole question of citizen involvement. Um, we get the prisons we want. We get the prisons we deserve based on how much time and effort we put into it. I have uh, one question about recidivism, okay, because this whole question that's bothered me for a while, but the last, one of the last uh, panels, one of our panelists said, the numbers on the percentages on recidivism are inflated or distorted because um, more than half of the people who are going back into prison are parole violations rather than repeat offenders. And that is important because in the, the subject of reentry, if a community is resistant to uh, inmates coming out of prison and moving back into the community because they think that they are predisposed to committing more crime, when in fact the, the numbers are not really accurate, can you comment on that? Is that, I mean, this is a loaded number. Where, where you read, where you look at the national number and they say 67% of the people in prison nationally are going to go back in after they're released. 42% in New York State. Um, should we, should we, uh, can we, uh, can you enlighten us in any way? That, that's usually two weeks worth of lectures in my <laughs> class on this question. Uh, but your, your, your point is, is, is a valid one. So typically, uh, we, we talk about 40 to 50 percent of the people released from prison returning to prison within five years. That's a very narrow definition uh, because if you said what percentage of the people released from prison end up in a county jail and then maybe do six months but never come back to state prison, it would drive it even higher. Mm -hmm. So that number, so when, when the state of New York reports its recidivism, they are only reporting people who return to state prison. So if, if you get out of Sing Sing uh, after you've done a couple of years and you get arrested and you do six months or nine months in Westchester County Jail, you don't get counted. What they do count, to your point, is people who get out of Sing Sing and don't commit a new crime and don't get sent back with a new conviction, but rather violate the terms of their parole. And the way it works, um, we have in New York an indeterminate sentencing system for most crimes. Uh, you, you know, so when you hear uh, three to nine, one to three, that means that an individual goes to prison for an indeterminate period. And how long they spend is determined by a parole board. And the one or the three or the, the bottom number is the minimum they must serve. They can't get out before that. But any time after they've served that, the parole board can let them out. So, for example, a person who gets a sentence of three to nine must do three years, but can be released after three years, but before nine years. And when they get out, they essentially sign a contract with the state. It says, I will be a good boy, and I will follow a bunch of rules. Let me tell you, there's not a person in this room that could follow those rules. Uh, you remember the famous saying, Judge Wachler, our former state chief judge, said you could indict a ham sandwich? Let me tell you, I could, I could violate the parole of an Eagle Scout. Uh, nobody can follow those rules. So, and the theory is that the parole officer, which I once was, is watching this individual and carefully paying attention to the behavior and interceding in their life when they start to go astray before they have a chance to commit a new crime. And so if I send them back to prison, I've prevented a new crime. I've prevented a new victimization. I have to tell you that 
the research shows that that just isn't so. There are states that have done away with parole and they have no more crime committed by people released from prison. So it is a very complicated question and the whole issue of what, and it gets to my point about rehabilitation, people are coming out of prisons and jails every day. They're all, the ones in Westchester County Jail are coming back to, as Justin said, Yonkers and Katona and Mount Vernon. And the ones from Sing Sing are coming back to Yonkers and Katona and Mount Vernon, as well as Brooklyn and Queens and Long Island, and probably a few going up to Albany and Buffalo. But they're all coming home. So everybody comes home and everybody on the day they're released has some statistical probability of succeeding or failing based on who they are, based on their life experience, based on their interpersonal abilities, based on how they experienced imprisonment, but based on a couple of other things that just make sense. If we release a person, a man, from Sing Sing Prison after he's been locked up for five or six years and send him back to the city of New York, uh, let me just digress for one moment, that tour that Tony Contrero gave me in 1969, I vividly remember him taking me into one of the industrial shops at Sing Sing where I talked to a prisoner who said to me, yeah, when I get out of parole, they're going to give me $40 and a suit of clothes. And he said, that's enough to buy a gun. Today, when we let people leave Sing Sing, we still give them $40 and a suit of clothes 48 years later. We haven't changed it. So that's the difference is you can't buy a gun for forty dollars today. But they come out, and if they leave Sing Sing, and they're going to go back to New York City with forty dollars and a suit of clothes, where are they going to live? Are they going to live on the streets? Become one of our homeless? Are they going to go to a, one of our homeless shelters? Which people, when I ran the city jails, told me they liked the jails better than the shelters. They was they they, they were safer and cleaner. Where are they going to work? Right? And most of the men and women in prison and jail are addicted to something, alcohol or drugs. And if we send them back to live on the street with no job and an addiction, they're going to get high. And if they get high, they're coming back. So when I say I don't care for the term rehabilitation, I think we don't pay enough attention to making sure that when men and women leave prison, they leave with a home, a job, and a plan to stay sober. And I say, I, I say this all the time. Take care of those three things, and the rehabilitation will take care of itself. I agree. I know we're wrapping up on time, but rehabilitation and reentry, these, these tend to be touchy-feely subjects that I think people associate with, with uh, people being soft on prison populations, but it is a key safety component of having a successful jail or prison system is getting these people ready to hit the streets, um, particularly in a, in a local jail where the majority of our people are going back to the streets on the bus or walking out the front door. So what we try and do at Westchester is make sure that really the basics, the, the 40 bucks in the suit, are there for our people. Um, whether it's discharge prescriptions so that they can get their medication that they were taking in the facility, uh, some of the best mental health and medical care that they get are while they're at the county jail. Um, getting their Section 8 benefits restarted so that they have a place where they can go right to DSS. A lot of things terminate upon your walking in the front door of the county jail. Your eligibility for Medicaid, your Section 8, these kinds of things are critical components to people being able to re-enter. Um, with regard to recidivism rates too, it's interesting because this is all, it's very interesting to people as, as data, but it depends on where you set the goalposts. How many people are going to recidivate within 24 hours? Probably not many. How many within a year or six months? So it's all soft science that you can, a lot of times you get the question, how much does it cost to keep a person at the county jail? Does it cost more to put a kid in Harvard than it does to put a kid in county jail? And I could come up with, depending on if I want to say that it's 60 bucks a day or $600 a day, it's, it's what your audience is and what your audience wants to hear. So just having, you guys here shows it is really a boon to me to know that there's people out there that care about the business that we're in and the work that we do. It's not just about banging bars and bread and water and that kind of stuff. It is about restoring broken people uh, and showing compassion to people that are tough to show compassion to. 
Um, it, it's a tough business, and it's, and it's people that you know we all see are damaged and can damage other people. But it, it really, it's it's a public safety concern. And just one last one. We don't do it. I, I don't suggest that we pay attention to those things out of charity. Right. I suggest we do it out of self-interest. Correct. Well, this has been a really interesting uh, program. I appreciate our experts here. And um, my hope is that the Sing Sing Prison Museum, what will make it the best in the country, is not only that we're going to tell this compelling story of uh, that pull the curtain back from this uh, largely unknown story uh, to most people of the history of Sing Sing, but also be a platform for all these different programs and issues that are not going to be resolved tonight, may not be resolved over a period of time, but I think Sing Sing Prison Museum will be the right place uh, to, uh, to continue uh, that conversation. So please join me in thanking our panel. Well, we're going to be ushered out soon out of the library, but I think our panelists will be around for a conversation. Thanks again.